All right, good morning and welcome to our first service on Sunday morning, which is our Bible prophecy update. On Sunday mornings we have two services, the first of which is Bible prophecy, and then the second is our regular sermon. It's a verse by verse teaching through the Word of God. We would encourage you to join with us. That will be at 11.15 a.m. And by the way, on the mainland many of you have uh, set your clocks forward for daylight savings time. Uh, you should know that in Hawaii we do not have daylight savings time. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the time difference is going to be uh, one hour ahead. So 11.15 a.m. Hawaii time. And we're currently in the book of Titus. And today's text will be chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, in a sermon I've titled, What's Taught? What's Caught? So again, we'll encourage you to join with us for second service at 1115. We would also really encourage you, for those of you online, to go directly to jdfarag.org for both today's prophecy update and the second service. Both will be live streamed. However, the update in its uncensored entirety will only be available for viewing on the site. So we are back on YouTube for now um, and Facebook. But uh, for the prophecy update, we will end the live stream and the entire live stream and the entire prophecy update can be viewed on the site. So with that, let's get right to it. A lot to get to today, actually. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm hoping to explain how it's all going down <laughs> as it relates to the fulfillment of key Bible prophecies. And by that I mean a chronological order of sorts concerning both how and when that which was foretold in Scripture will come to pass. I'm going to paint the prophetic canvas with a broad brush for a number of reasons, not the least of which is in the interest of time. And if you'll kindly allow me to, I'll begin with what I would argue are the eight main prophetic events on the end times calendar. Then after going through this list, we're going to take a closer look at each one of them. And we're going to do that to have a better understanding of why what's happening is happening in the world today. This, this is why. <laughs> this is because it's the end. And this is what we were told it would be like at the time of the end. All right, let's go through this. Now, we're going to have the guys leave this up. For those of you online, you can take a screenshot if you want. By the way, uh, we're hoping to also, as soon as we can, put the transcript on the website. So you'll have everything there as well. Now you're, you'll notice that three of these are highlighted in yellow, and there's a reason for that. And that reason is, is because we don't really have the specificity in Scripture as to the timing of these prophecies. The others we do, and that's what we're going to go over. So number one, the pre-tribulation rapture. Number two, the seven-year peace agreement. Number three, the seven-year tribulation. Number four, the battle of Gog and Magog. Number five, the abomination of desolation that takes place in the newly rebuilt temple there in Israel on the Temple Mount. Number six, the mark of the beast. Number seven, the battle of Armageddon. And number eight, finally, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So uh, you ready? Let's go into these. Let's start with the next event on God's prophetic clock, which is that of the pre-tribulation rapture. Because we've gone in depth concerning the 
and I want you to listen very carefully to how I say this, the sound doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture, I'm going to draw your attention to two videos. The first one is the rapture comes first, and it's from our verse by verse teaching in 2 Thessalonians, specifically chapter 2, verse 3. We devoted an entire study to just that one verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Then the second one is the prophecy update from back on August 8th of last year, which we devoted an entire update to. It's titled, Pre-Tribulation Rapture Proof. Uh, maybe it goes without saying, but this is not something in this world in which we live. Well, let me, let me re rephrase that. We live in a world today that is most unforgiving of any ambiguity concerning the sound doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, are we good? That wasn't very convincing. We better move on. <laughs> this brings us to the second one on our list, which is that of the seven year peace agreement foretold of by the prophet Daniel. Daniel 9.27, very detailed prophecy. We've talked about this often in the past. Let me read verse uh, 27, Daniel 9, speaking of the Antichrist, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. This is a period of seven years. In the middle of the seven, the three and a half year mark, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, which again presupposes that the temple has to be there in order for there to be sacrifices and offerings. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, beginning in verse 15, Jesus actually references specifically this prophecy in Daniel. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then, verse 16, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. He is delineating between the first part of the seven year tribulation spoken of by Daniel, and the second part of the seven year tribulation, which he refers to as the great tribulation, the last three and a half years. Hang on to that. We'll come back to that in a moment. I want to draw your attention to another prophecy in Daniel. This one's in chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. Again, speaking of the Antichrist, it says, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully. Sounds like an oxymoron, right? A paradox. <laughs> uh, one, some translations render it fearfully. And shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And verse 25, listen, through his policy, interesting word, also he shall cause craft, another interesting word, to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. 
It will come by way of peace. The destruction comes by way of peace. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, that's Jesus at the second coming, but he shall be broken without hand. That's the end of it, at the end of the seven year tribulation. Kind of getting ahead of myself here, so let me stay on message. Here again, we've done a deep dive, as it were, starting with the deal of the century, as it's been dubbed. And we devoted a prophecy update to this back on February 2nd of last year. All of these links are provided below uh, in a PDF file, by the way. Subsequently, we addressed the prophetic significance of the Abraham Accords in the August 16th update titled, Peace with Many. It's important to understand that the aforementioned confirming of the seven year peace agreement in Daniel 9, 27, that's what starts the seven year tribulation, not the rapture. The rapture does not start the seven year tribulation. The specificity of Bible prophecy is such that it is the seven year peace agreement that is confirmed. Now this is an interesting word in the original language of the Hebrew. It's the same word in my native tongue of Arabic. It's the word ikbir, which carries with it the idea of greater, superior, even spectacular. So the Antichrist, and this also again presupposes there's already an agreement on the table. And then he comes along and he makes it better greater, superior. And that's what confirms it and starts it, and with it the seven year tribulation. Now, the specificity with which Daniel records this prophecy provides us with a divine outline, as it's been called, of this final prophetic timeline. In other words, we know that it is a seven year period. It's the 70th week of Daniel. And this prophecy delineates between the first three and a half years and the last three and a half years. Because we're told that at the three and a half year mark, and by the way, this comports with another prophecy in, of all places, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We spent some time on that in our verse by verse study through 2 Thessalonians, where the Apostle Paul talks about the Antichrist exalting himself in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And oh, by the way, as Jesus in Matthew 24 said, pray that when this happens at the midpoint, that you're not pregnant because transportation becomes virtually impossible and more difficult, infinitely more difficult. Also pray that it's not on the Sabbath because everything shuts down. And also pray it's not in the winter because when it snows, <laughs> uh, it shuts everything down there. So they're going to flee and not even look back. When this happens, don't, don't even go back to your house and get your, you know, clothes or pack your, you know, bags. You don't have time. Flee, run. And we're told in the book of Revelation where they're going to run to, this place that God prepared for them to protect them for the last three and a half years of the seven year tribulation. It's believed that it is in modern day Jordan, a place called Petra which I had the uh, privilege of seeing. My cousin, who actually lives in Jordan, took my wife and I there. This was BC, not before Christ, before children, <laughs> when we could actually travel. And uh, we got to uh, go to Petra. Oh my goodness, this rock city. Uh, by the way, parenthetically, let me say that some Bible scholars believe that this is actually the place that Job lived. I mean, this is an amazing place. 
So it is believed that this is the place that the Jews will flee to when they realize this is not our Christ, this is not our Messiah. Our Messiah would never commit such an abomination and cause such desolation. And they will flee for the last three and a half years. And God supernaturally and miraculously will protect them from the Antichrist. This is when they come to a saving knowledge of their true Christ, Jesus the Christ. And it's really quite interesting. We've talked about the typology before, and I don't want to go too far into it. But very interesting, because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a picture of Israel. They're thrown into a seven times hotter fiery furnace. And in the midst of that furnace, they're saved. So too is Israel, whom they picture, saved in the middle of the seven year tribulation. And it even gets better. We've talked about this before. Daniel, where is he? Oh, he's not there. Why? Because pre-furnace, he was exalted and taken up to a high position, and as such is not there. He's a picture of the church. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Daniel pictures the church. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego picture Israel going into, saved because of, in the midst of, and through the seven year tribulation. Okay. Now, let's fast forward to the book of Revelation. Actually, some affectionately refer to the book of Daniel as the Old Testament book of Revelation, and rightfully so. I would suggest that the book of Revelation provides the ultimate prophetic timeline by virtue of the divine outline in Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. What does Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 say? Well now this is Jesus talking to John, and He tells John, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. In the original language is metatauta, meaning after these things. In other words, Jesus is telling John to write that which was past, that which is present, and that which will be yet future. And therein lies this divine outline that we know as the book of Revelation, starting with the past, then to the present, and then to the future. So we're going to put this up as well for you. And we'll have the guys leave it up. You can take a screenshot if you want. Here's this divine outline in the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, past. John is told to write that which he had seen. He was an eyewitness of. What was he an eyewitness of? Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected, and glorified. Chapter 1 is all past. Chapters 2 and 3, present. Uh, you know those um, maps, or when you go to a place, and you, you want to know how to get somewhere, and it says, you are here. Right? Thank you. <laughs> Make sure you're still with me. You know, do we need to serve some more coffee or something? <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe I had too much coffee. I don't know. But so this is where we are. Here's this, this map, Revelation. You are here. Where? Revelation chapters 2 and 3. What's Revelation chapters 2 and 3? You know, seven letters to seven churches. Church history, present. Chapter 4 verse 1 on is all future. In fact, in chapter 4 verse 1, John is told to, at the sound of the trumpet, come up here. He's taken up. That's the rapture. And do you know that from chapter 4, verse 1 on, you don't find the word church mentioned even one time. But in chapters 1 through 3, the word church is mentioned 19 times. Why is that important? Because chapters 6 through 19 deal with the seven-year tribulation. 
And the word church is not in chapter 6 through 19, dealing with the tribulation. Why? I know this is deeply profound. The word church isn't in those chapters dealing with the tribulation, because the church isn't in the tribulation. The purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. Why don't you join with me? We'll make a rap song out of that one. (laughs) Got a ring to it, doesn't it? (laughs) So chapter 6 through 19, the tribulation, chapter 20, the millennium, the kingdom age, and chapters 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. Listen, God is a God of order. (laughs) God is a God of perfect design, because God is perfect. Now this brings us to the fourth one on our list, and it's the Battle of Gog, as it's referred to, which, as I mentioned prior, we really don't have a specific timeline on when this prophecy is fulfilled. I do realize that some have grabbed a hold of Ezekiel 39 verse 9, as a reference to the seven-year tribulation vis-a-vis the seven years of fuel that Israel uses for that period of time after this alliance of nations that invades Israel is dealt a devastating defeat. And by the way, it does seem to indicate that it will be very swift. Uh, Some believe that it will be within a period of about 24 hours when Russia, Iran, Turkey, and this alliance of nations invade Israel, fulfilling the Ezekiel 38 prophecy, that it will happen very fast. And I love it when God does this, because we're told in Ezekiel 38 the why behind it. He says, I'm going to do it like this, so that all the nations will know that I am God because there's no other explanation. I mean, you get, have you seen a map lately? I'm not very good at geography. I never did well in school when it came to geography. But if you, if you look at a map, here's Israel right here. You, you might miss it. You might need to, you know, kind of zoom in. It's right, right there. And then here's Russia. And here's Iran and Turkey and all of these nations. And you got little itsy bitsy Israel. And all these nations are going to invade Israel. And they're going to be defeated. Wow, don't mess with Israel. Yeah, (laughs) because of the God of Israel. Well, I want to draw you. I love Ezekiel 38, by the way. Hey, it's in play right now, by the way. It's already in motion. It's beginning to come to pass. Iran, Turkey, and Russia are at the ready in, of all places, Syria, from which they will invade Israel. Now I want to draw your attention to verses 10 through 13 in Ezekiel 30. I think you'll see why here in a moment. We need to keep moving here. (laughs) Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass, that thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. This is speaking of Gog. This is the, God says, I'm going to put a hook in your jaw and bring you against my people. God does that. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to, listen, a peaceful people who dwell safely in peace and stability, peace and security, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Verse 13, Sheba Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, 
and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? It's quite a bit of a a detail right there for us, isn't it? Because Sheba and Dedan is modern day Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states that we know them today, these Arab nations. So in other words, not only are they not involved in this invasion of Israel, which you would think they would be as enemies of Israel, but it sounds like something happened to where now they have good foreign relations with Israel, so much so that they would protest this invasion of Israel. Well, (laughs) I think you know where I'm going with this, right? What we can surmise from the details in just these verses here in Ezekiel 38, is that this invasion happens when Israel seems to be dwelling in peace and security. It's for this reason, though I'm not dogmatic, that this specific prophecy may likely be fulfilled after the seven year peace agreement is confirmed. Another reason is because of the detail in verse 13 about Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, which I personally believe is perfectly posturing them in preparation by way of the Abraham Accords. On Monday, this is this last week. (laughs) Oh, you're not supposed to read it until I get to it. This is stunning. I don't know how else to say it. This last week was one of those weeks where I had just the volume of material was such that I, there was no way that I could get to it all two days. So I kind of put it aside and Lord willing, maybe we'll revisit it. But as fast as things are moving, I I know next week's not going to be any slower. (laughs) So, but this is stunning. It's a report from Israel Today about how the Saudis are saying that the Temple Mount and the Al-Aqsa Mosque are not important to Islam. The subheading reads, in further departure from Palestinian narrative, Saudis recognize Jewish connection to the Temple Mount. Listen to these uh, excerpts. According to a bunch of Saudis and the other Middle East Arabs, my people, (laughs) on social media, the Temple Mount and even gasp, (gasps) Al-Aqsa itself aren't all that holy to them. Last week on Twitter, Saudis conducted a campaign promoting Islam's true holy sites, Mecca and Medina, both of which of course are in Saudi Arabia, much to the consternation of Shiite Islam in Iran. So those are the true holy sites, Mecca and Medina, while downplaying the importance of Jerusalem in their religion. Gasp is an understatement. Can I just do that gasp again? (gasps) (laughs) One of the more viral tweets was posted by Saudi cartoonist Fahd al-Jabiri, who wrote that, quote, the direction of the prayers of the Jews is not important to us. What is important to us is only our homeland by referencing the direction of the prayers of the Jews, Al-Jabiri implicitly recognized the Jewish connection to the Temple Mount, thus contradicting the Palestinian narrative on the matter. 
Um, I'm going to have the guys just leave this up for just a little bit. I want you to see this picture. Okay, <laughs> you ready for this? <laughs> An English language tweet by a man from Morocco named Ibtissam really got people heated when he not only emphasized that the Temple Mount <laughs> is of no particular importance to Muslims like himself, but then went on to express his hope that the third Jewish temple will soon be built there. There were a flood of tweets expressing support and even love for Israel. Most were in Arabic, but the few in English were no less heartwarming. One reacted to a previous tweet calling Jerusalem the occupied Palestinian capital. The Saudi <laughs> corrected the original by noting that Jerusalem is actually the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Okay. This dovetails into number five on our list, which is the abomination that causes desolation taking place in the rebuilt third temple. Again, this prophecy presupposes that the rebuilding of the third Jewish temple will somehow be a part of the seven year peace agreement, which I truly believe it will be. And the reason is that the temple must be there at the midpoint of the seven year tribulation in order for the sacrifices to stop and the abomination that causes desolation to take place. So I really believe that this will be the deal that will be part of the deal. Hey, you can have your temple. Where do we sign? And the question becomes, how long will it take them? Oh, not long. Do they have everything? Yeah. What are you thinking? Just a ballpark estimate. 90 days? Maybe even 60 days. What? Yeah, as soon as they get the green light, they can rebuild that temple, some believe, in about 60 days. 90 days tops. How's that one? Last week I mentioned a video that Pastor Ray Bentley of Maranatha Chapel in San Diego sent me, and we're going to include the link again this week. I would really encourage you, if you haven't already, to take the time to watch it. It is a must-see. In it, he talks about the fulfillment of prophecy vis-a-vis -vis the Abraham Accords and how that Israel and the UAE slash Saudi Arabia very soon, are looking at the possibility of constructing a massive Israeli canal project. Stay with me. Pictured here is a map showing the existing Israeli oil pipeline in solid red, the proposed Red Med Canal in the black dash line, and the proposed oil pipeline from Saudi Arabia to Haifa in the red dash line, which goes through, of all places, the Jezreel Valley, aka Megiddo, the Valley of Armageddon, where that final battle, the Battle of Armageddon, will take place. Let me just say at this juncture that I truly believe the hook that God is going to put in the jaw of this alliance of nations with Russia, Iran, and Turkey at the helm. It's going to be the oil and the natural gas and this pipeline. Did you know that about 90 percent of the economy, particularly in Russia, comes from oil? I know I mentioned this last week, and I want to take too much time on it, but uh, that's what's going to bring them. It's going to be this. And oh, by the way, this is why Saudi Arabia says, uh, what, why are you guys doing this? Are you coming to take the beautiful oil pipeline we built? 
there and uh, take that from, uh, oh, that's why. And, they, and that's why they protested. Well, I mentioned it again this week because Ray sent me episode two, which we also have the link to. And this one is about the rebuilt third temple. I, I know it, it almost sounds, um, I don't want to sound or come off sensational. I'll be as calm as I possibly can, which by the way, goes very much against my nature. Um, but uh, everything we're told in Scripture is happening now. It's happening now. Everything's ready to go. So on Sunday, the Jerusalem Post published an article titled, An Israeli Suez Canal. Listen to these quotes. In technological terms, Israel has always been absurdly ambitious, irrigating its desert, designing microprocessors, developing drones, shooting down rockets, being by far the smallest country to launch its own satellites. Israel is a superpower of science and engineering, Ezekiel 38. So proposing Israel undertake absurdly complex infrastructure projects isn't altogether absurd. Israel is working with China to build a railway from Eilat to the Mediterranean. It's intended to serve as an overland alternative to the Suez Canal. A trans-Israel canal would be incredible and an incredibly difficult undertaking. But Israel is equipped to handle it. Israel itself was incredible and an incredibly difficult undertaking. That's because God did it. Israel's economy, its roles in the energy market, in world trade, in globalizing technology are expanding every day. It's time for Israel to make itself a two ocean nation. Why do I uh, emphasize this? Because the description of Israel in Ezekiel 38 is the description of Israel today. They're prosperous. They found a lot of oil, a lot of natural gas. That's why they're doing all this. And it has aroused the ire of the likes of Russia, Iran, and Turkey because of it, exactly as God's Word said it would be. Well, let's keep moving. All of this has profound prophetic implications, specifically concerning the aforementioned prophecy in Ezekiel. And it also has profound prophetic implications concerning Revelation chapter 16, verses 14 through 16, which is number seven on our list. It's the Battle of Armageddon, which is, I believe, we, we're not told specifically, but it does seem that it would be towards the end of the seven-year tribulation, like the Battle of Gog is towards the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. You can see both battles as bookends on the seven-year tribulation. And I also believe, according to the book of Revelation, that at the end of the seven-year tribulation, when the battle of Armageddon takes place, it will usher in number eight on our list, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's how it's all going to go down. Now, I know what you're thinking. I can read your mind. Just give me a second here. Pastor, you skipped number six on the list, which is the mark of the beast. Oh, how clever are you? The mark of the beast just happens to be the number six on your list. I'm not that clever. Don't be impressed. Well, I didn't skip it deliberately. Actually, I did skip it deliberately for a reason. And we're going to talk about it now. 
and for the remainder of our time, because it's going to, I believe, I hope anyway, tie everything together concerning these prophecies. So in order to do that, we're going to end the live stream. And for those that are on YouTube or Facebook, we would encourage you to go to jdfarag.org for the uncensored remainder. Okay. I want to refer you to two more videos that we've provided links to. The first of which is the January 10th update titled Decision Time. And the second is Decision Time 2. And in both videos we go into great detail about the COVID-19 vaccine. I want you to listen to the word I'm going to use here, okay? Becoming the mark of the beast. Becoming the mark of the beast. In fact, in both of those updates, we answer a number of questions regarding the current vaccine and the potential for this vaccine to ultimately, eventually, in and during the seven-year tribulation, become the mark of the beast. I truly believe it will become the mark of the beast during the seven-year tribulation. And both videos, we go in depth into that. Now, we did those in January. And here we are now in the middle of March, about 60 days later. <laughs> and it's, ha it's actually happening. It's happening now. What's happening? Well, the increasing pressure to be vaccinated. Right now it's being incentivized. I'm, I'm hearing reports of people being offered financial compensation to take it. Now that's one side of it, but on the other side of it, there's also the incentive of, hey, you, you want your job back? Or you want to keep your job? You have to get vaccinated. Uh, you want your life back? You have to be vaccinated. You want to take that face diaper, I mean face mask off? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I mean no disrespect to those who wear masks. I mean if you want to wear a mask, that's okay. <laughs> this is the no mask shaming zone. I hope you know that. Yeah, that's great. I, okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I love you guys so much. <laughs> Last week, Mike Montgomery, a pastor friend of mine, sent me this Daily Wire article about how New Yorkers will have to show a COVID-19 passport in order to enter stadiums, theaters, and businesses. Here's some of what they had to say. And oh, by the way, I have, again, maybe Lord willing, next week, uh, one of our elders sent me an article about this coming to Hawaii. Aloha. Have a nice afternoon. We're not clapping now, are we? <laughs> okay, all right. The plan establishes an Excelsior Pass, which will use secure technology, yeah right, to prove that a state resident has been vaccinated against COVID-19. Sites include in the rollout plan in Madison Square Garden and the Barclays Center, both sports and entertainment venues. Similar to a mobile airline boarding pass, individuals will be able to either print out their passes or store it on their smartphones using the Excelsior Passes wallet app. Each pass will have a secure QR code, which venues will scan using a companion app to confirm someone's COVID health status. The program is already underway as the pass was tested at Tuesday night's New York Rangers hockey game at Madison Square Garden, according to a New York Post report. 
on Wednesday. The Times of Israel published a report stating that according to the CDC, fully vaccinated people can now gather without masks. Oh, here's a quote. Fully vaccinated Americans can gather with other vaccinated people indoors without wearing a mask or social distancing, according to long awaited guidance from federal health officials. The guidance is designed to address a growing demand as more adults have been getting vaccinated and wondering if it gives them greater freedom to visit family members, travel, or do other things that they have done before the COVID-19 pandemic swept the world last year. In fact, it was last year this month. About 30 million Americans, or about 9% of the U.S. population, have been fully vaccinated with a federally authorized COVID-19 vaccine so far, according to the CDC. 30 million Americans. I have to confess that I'm a little taken back by that number. And I'm hoping that what I'm about to share with you will explain why. I had a number of online members send me this video titled, Shot in the Dark. It's a Daystar interview with Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. And I want to share with you a few excerpts. I'm hoping it'll answer some questions for you. I know it did for me. Quoting, first, regarding the number of vaccinations back in the 1980s. Last week I mentioned that it was over 70, not vaccines, but doses. But people my age, it was three to five vaccines. Uh, children today will get over 27 vaccines, totaling a total of over 70 doses of these vaccines. So when she was asked about it, she said that up through 1985, there were only three different shots. 1991, is when they started ramping up the schedule. And that makes total sense when you look at what happened commencing in 1991. Talk more about that in a moment. She was asked about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. She said, what they've done with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine shot is they've actually taken a typical adenovirus that causes the cold, and they've shelled it out. They've taken the genetic material of that adenovirus out from the inside, and they've taken an already made spike protein and put it inside of the adenovirus shell in order to grow that and replicate it. To make it grow, they are using at least one and maybe two different types of tissue cells that come from aborted fetal tissue. I would prefer to call it aborted babies. One is called PCRC6, which comes from retinal tissues of previously aborted babies. And there's another one called HEK, we've talked about this, that comes from a kidney of a previously aborted baby. They have to have viruses in order to get a large enough quantity to manufacture a shot or a vaccine. They have to replicate it in living tissues. That's why those tissues are used. This protein, and they believe the antibodies also can cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain and attack at least three, if not four different types of tissue, types that were discovered by this group out of California who did the research. Also, one of the things that we just found out about is they're actually, get this, testing the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine on infants and pregnant women. How is it possible? Or how is it legal to test it on 
a newborn when they can't give consent. Precisely the point. At the end of the interview, Dr. Tenpenny was asked the following question. I know several people in my neighborhood who've got the vaccine and have talked about those same side effects that you mentioned. And so it's natural to worry about them. What advice would you give to people who've gotten these vaccines and are now getting this information and they're scared? What would you say to them? Dr. Tenpenny's response, quote, well, it's a disturbing answer that you don't want to hear. With the types of things that this injection does, binding the spike protein to the surface of your cells, making an antibody, which means you're sensitized to that forever, this genetic bite, through a process called transfection, binding spike protein to all your cells. Once you've been vaccinated, you cannot become unvaccinated. A lot of the other vaccines, people want to know what they can do to detox from the mercury or the aluminum or the viruses. This is an irreversible thing once you've made that decision. I can't tell you how many people say, I don't want to hear about it. Just give me the shot. I want to be back to the convenience in my life. So you're changing, exchanging a lifetime of probable illness, possibly even death. So you can have that convenience and get on an airplane and go to the store. People really need to know about this. I've done over 400 interviews in the last year about this. I haven't been quiet about it, and neither have a lot of other people. And then she says this, quote, people really need to put their lives in God's hands and not in the hands of a pharmaceutical. So this last week, I spent some time seeking the Lord and reflecting on all of the prophecy updates over the last year since March of 2020. And I, I hope you know that I owe many of you a profound debt of gratitude for all the information that you've sent me over the last year. I have learned so much, so much so that I find myself thinking about that well-known saying of, if only I'd had known then <laughs> what I know now. And I'm not just talking about the last year, I'm talking about, man, when our kids were born. I share that to say this, were it not for COVID-19, I would have never known the truth about vaccines. As I've shared in the past, this hits close to home for me, now that I know the truth about vaccine injuries. I'll take it a step further and say that, had the Lord not opened my eyes to this truth, I too would have been deceived about this evil, I would even say demonic, satanic coronavirus vaccine. Now, before I share with you an email from an online member, may I humbly ask those that are watching online who take issue with what I just said, I just want to very lovingly and humbly ask that you stop watching this video. I say that in love. The online member writes, Pastor J.D., I'm a 39-year-old wife and mother of four children, ages 13, 11, 9, and 5. I faithfully began listening to your updates each Sunday last July. I embraced your bold style immediately, and perhaps unlike the majority of new listeners, had no cognitive dissonance to overcome in regard to the corruption 
of the pharmaceutical industry and vaccine makers in particular. My second born and only son, now 11, was a thriving toddler who threw footballs, spoke early, was breastfed and nurtured well at home. That was all before he turned 18 months and received several shots at once, including the MMR. As you have undoubtedly heard these accounts before, I'll save the details and just sum it up by saying he regressed in development, got sick for months with respiratory viruses and was never the same, resulting in a diagnosis of ASD, autism spectrum disorder, when he was four. With that diagnosis, doctors leave you little hope for your child living full lives and warn against having more children as they might have the same genes. We went on to do our own research and could not believe how vaccine companies have zero liability. Uh, we talked about that in an update last year. It was the act of 1986 that President, then President Ronald Reagan signed that held harmless, no liability for pharmaceutical companies with vaccine injuries. You cannot sue the vaccine uh, uh, producer. You cannot sue the pharmaceutical company. She goes on, how safety studies have never been truly done, how so many mothers have been told they are crazy for correlating vaccines to their children's developmental disorders and medical conditions. We went on to have two more healthy daughters who have not had a vaccine and have been the healthiest, brightest children. They've never required antibiotics or even a sick day from school. Incredible immune systems designed from God and undefiled from toxins. Meanwhile, our son continues to bring us to our knees with grief and weary hearts. Despite my husband working two jobs to pay for his therapy and natural supplements, he continues to present with very challenging behaviors. COVID-19 school closures and other parts of his essential routine changing have made him decline further. He's such a sweet soul who loves worship music and still loves veggie tales. We pray daily that God will give him a sound mind and keep him safe. It grieves my heart to see him struggle. It's heartbreaking to hear people, many within the church, say it's poor parenting. I felt compelled to share this with you because your updates have brought me true hope. Hope that Jesus will soon return and restore my son. Hope that truth will prevail. Hope that pastors like you are awake to the darkness around us and not afraid to warn the masses. I'm praying that God will continue to use your ministry to encourage those like me who need to remember that soon and very soon these temporary troubles will be over and we will rest in His arms. Thank you, Pastor J.D. You are truly a blessing to those of us who feel unheard and overwhelmed by this corrupt world. Can't wait to meet you soon. So after receiving this email, I talked with Jimmy Sims. He's our amazing drummer on our worship team. And I asked him about this. I even shared the email with him because it reads almost verbatim like their story. As many of you know, Jimmy and Tammy's son Noah, who by the way turns 18, I can't believe it. When I first met him, he was just very young. He's going to be 18 years old. Well, he was diagnosed with autism after being vaccinated. They have given me permission to share this with the hopes that it will be an encouragement to the many like them and online members like the one I just shared the email with. Here's part of a text Jimmy sent me. 
Thank you, Pastor JD, for sharing that letter. Now my mascara is running again. It's all good. Not that we men wear mascara. It's a, you had to, it's an inside thing. Okay. My heart goes out to that sister and her family. What she wrote to you was pretty much our family experience. The Holy Spirit showed me that I don't need a normal son to experience a loving relationship with him, but to just love on him, even though he puts me, Tammy, and my daughters in challenging situations with his behavior issues, and is not able to adequately communicate with us. We love him so much. We thank God so much for bringing Noah into our lives, and that God chose us to be his family. Just like that sister's son, Noah loves his praise and worship music and videos. Okay, here's the bottom line. This COVID-19 vaccine, which is not even a vaccine, is, I believe, going to be the final nail in the proverbial coffin of the world's population. And if this weren't bad enough, not only will it end in countless deaths at such a time as it becomes the mark of the beast in the seven year tribulation, it will end in the population's damnation for all eternity. Now, let me hasten to say, does this mean that Christians who have already taken the vaccine have lost their salvation? Absolutely not. If you're born again, you cannot be unborn again. And again, we talked about this in decision time and decision time two. We answered every single one of these questions and then some. One last thing. You'll forgive the strength with which I say this, but the swiftness with which the vaccination is moving is nothing shy of chilling. Would you agree? I think the question we need to ask ourselves is that of Operation Warp Speed being just that, warp speed, by virtue of how quickly it's happening. Now, here's another question, and I want you to think this through with me, and we'll bring it in for a close. If everything that's happened, and is happening, in just the span of a few months, is any indication, then I ask you, how close are we really? You've got all the peace agreements in place, just waiting at the ready. You have Iran and Russia and Turkey at the ready in Syria to invade Israel. You have Israel that is, I mean, the prosperous envy of the entire world in just about every arena economically, especially now with this oil. You have Saudi Arabia and the Arab states, exactly as we're told in Ezekiel 38, that are doing exactly what we were told they would do. And it's like this. It's, it's, I use this expression, you'll forgive me, it's like we're a gnat's eyebrow away. And yes, gnats have eyebrows, in case you were wondering. That's how close we are. And the next event is going to be the rapture. And I truly believe, and I know that I say this every week, and I hope you don't tire of me saying it, because I'm going to keep saying it. There will come a time when I won't say it. <laughs> I won't be here to say it. And you better not be here either. <laughs> That's how close we are. I believe the rapture can happen at any time. And then once we are taken out of the way, and the Holy Spirit as the restrainer is taken out of the way. It's game on. 
and everything's ready. All you have to do is just flick the switch, and it's going to happen. This is why we do these updates. This is why we end with the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. It's also why we do, by way of a simple childlike explanation of salvation, the ABCs of salvation. What is the gospel? The gospel is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. It's also in 1 Thessalonians. It's that Jesus came, He was crucified, He was buried, and He rose again on the third day, and He's coming back again one day. That's the good news of salvation. Because you see, this world, <laughs> how do I say this without? I actually prayed and asked the Lord to help me with this. So let me, let me try this this way. This world is doomed and damned and going to hell. And every day people enter into eternity, taking their last breath here and their first breath in eternity. And we're all going to spend eternity somewhere, either in hell or in heaven. The bad news is we've all been sentenced to hell because of sin. The good news is, is that Jesus came and He paid that penalty for us instead of us, so that we could live forever, eternal life with Him in heaven. What are the ABCs? The ABCs are just a simple way to explain to someone salvation. The A is for admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner and in need of the Savior. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. You might be a good person, but you'll never be good enough. And Romans 3.23 tells us why. It's because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 sort of packages, if I can say it this way, the bad news first with the good news in one verse. What's the bad news? The wages of sin is death, the death penalty. What's the good news? The good news is the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the A. Here's the B. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised Him from the dead. This is Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And the C, lastly, is for call upon the name of the Lord. Or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then lastly, Romans 10, 13. And you might be watching online right now, and if you are, I want to say to you that today is the day of salvation. Do not put off any longer the most important decision of your life for eternal life. Romans 10, 13 says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you'll just kindly give me two more minutes, I want to share with you an email that we received from an online member. You know, this is, I hope it's an encouragement for you. I know it is. For me, we've been doing these ABCs of salvation for well nigh three years now. And we continue to receive testimony after testimony of how people are coming to Christ. As a child, Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It's that simple childlike trust coming to Christ. Well, this is a, an email that we received from an online member. He writes, Dearest Pastor J.D., my name is Samuel, and I write from Italy. Through the usage of the ABCs of salvation, I've seen quite a few 
come to salvation. And I'm blessed to be able to use that tool. As an Ethiopian Italian, I use it in English, Italian, and Amharic, which is the Ethiopian language, along with pointing others to the many other languages available through your website. By the way, this is not the jdfrog.org website yet. We'll get there. But the calvarychapelkaneohe.com website. We have uh, a link that has all of these translations of the ABCs of salvation in all of these different languages. And you can take your pick. Some of them we have more than one. That's what he's referring to. In one particular case, I administered the gospel to a young Italian man about two years ago. He was open to hearing the ABCs, and I had given him a printed copy to go away with and think about it all. Well, we didn't see each other for quite some time after that, but as God would have it, I came across him about two months ago. He was excited to see me, but was with someone else and told me he wanted to call me and set up a time to talk. Later that day, he called, and we met the following morning. As we talked, I learned that, as only God can, God had been working behind the scenes, apparently, as of the pandemic and the lockdowns, He was freaked out by everything that was going on globally, and thought that we must already be in the tribulation. Well, long story short, it was the trigger for him fear of missing his opportunity led him to salvation. How wonderful that God is using the growing darkness of these times to lead folks to Him. Andrea, the guy, now messages me with encouragement from the Scriptures. He has an electronic copy of the ABCs in Italian, and I don't doubt (laughs) that he's spreading it far and wide. And I assure you, that for this sort of thing to take place here in Italy is no easy feat, but God. Longing to meet you in the twinkling of an eye, Samuel Maranatha. I'll take you up on that, Samuel. Why don't you stand? We'll have the worship team come up. Thank you for your patience. I know I've been going (laughs) longer like every week. I'm really pushing the envelope, right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just can't even begin to thank You enough for the gift of salvation, of eternal life. Thank You for making it so childlike simple. Lord, thank You even for everything that's happening in the world, because You're using it to bring people to You. What's meant for evil you as only you can, mean it for good, for the salvation of many this day. Lord, we truly believe that we are so close to that trumpet that's going to sound, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be raptured up, caught up, to meet you in the air. And they're going to be there too. All of those loved ones. Hmm. We can't wait, Lord. We love you so much, Lord. This is our hope, our only hope, is for you to take us out of this world. So Lord, come quickly. And for anyone that's never called upon You, Lord, I pray that today is the day of their salvation. In Jesus' name, Amen.